Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, November 2nd, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the elite says global warming is an environmental catastrophe, and now is the time for science-based action. This is a job for the Earth League. Meanwhile, Bill Gates says socialism will save the world. Then, if you're planning to give yourself and your family the flu shot this year, you might want to think twice. Here's what they're not telling you about the flu shot. Perfectly healthy girl nine paralyzed by flu shot, family claims. Plus, I will not put American boots on the ground in Syria. That was then, this is now. We're conducting such missions directly whether by strikes from the air or direct action on the ground. Obama flip-flops on boots on the ground in Syria. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. behavior that spurred me to do the research to develop a true nutraceutical formula that was designed to smooth out and help children focus. All of our children are hit with modern mind control. Television, music, fast food, GMOs, sugars, you name it. Young humans have not yet developed their nervous system and are being hammered daily by globalist concoctions. It's no wonder they can't focus and calm down and then are put on dangerous psychotropic drugs. Working with my team, we set out to find the best formula with the highest quality ingredients that children would actually like and take. We worked with the leading manufacturer in nutritional supplements that are safe for children to bring you the most affordable and powerful calming formula out there. Introducing Child Ease with herbs and calming extracts like chamomile and lemon balm and essential nutrients that taste great. Obtain your Child Ease today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's Child Ease exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com. <laughs> It's no longer necessary to try to infer or deduce how global governance is going to come to us. Global redistribution of wealth and a global control is now being presented as it's never been presented before, never more overtly, never more in the open than it is being done this year with climate change. Now, of course, these people tried six years ago at the Copenhagen summit and they failed. And they've been working on this agenda ever since. Let's take a look at the Earth Statement. And we're going to talk about who this comes from. It says, this is the year of opportunity for a sustainable future. They say 2015 is a critical year for humanity. Our civilization has never faced such existential risks as we are now faced with. And I agree with that. But I disagree that the risk is coming from man-made global warming. It's coming from global governance. But this is how they're going to bring it to us. They've been plotting this for the last six years. They say three times this year. World leaders will meet to set the course for decades to come. In July 2015, heads of state meet to discuss financing for development. In to September 2015, the UN Sustainable Development Goals will be adopted. And they were. We'll talk about those later. In December 2015, which is coming up one month, nations negotiate a new global climate agreement. Decisions made in this single year will be the legacy of our generation. How true. And yet most people don't realize what the purpose of this is or how it is coming to us. It will probably be enacted just like the Trans-Pacific Partnership by uh, executive decree, pretty much. That's what they've done with the fast tracking of treaties. It will probably be done during the holiday season so that people don't really look at this. But let's take a look at where this Earth Statement comes from and the man at the center. Look at this picture of the Earth League. This is from an article in May of this year. A call for science-based action. If you look at that picture, you will see Prince Charles at the center. Ah, but he's not the man in the center. The man who is really in the center of this is the man that's off to his right. John Schellenhuber, the German scientist. This man is essentially the Henry Kissinger or the Zbigniew Brzezinski of this movement. He is the guy behind all of this. He's put this out. Uh, he was at the core of all of the talking points six years ago. And now we see this year he has surfaced not as being behind Prince Charles, but really being behind the Pope and behind the Pope's encyclical earlier this summer to push global governance and now redistribution of wealth using government, uh, global government. That's what they're coming at us with in this, uh, this upcoming conference. Pope Francis 
appointed a population control extremist to the Vatican Post. And this is, again, going back to July. This is the uh, Breitbart article on him. It's nothing but a twist from 2009. It's the same agenda, the same Shellen Huber. This is a guy who is now behind the Pope and not Prince Charles. They need a kindler, gentler face than Prince Charles to sell this, and they need to sell it on a moral authority. But look at what they were selling. This guy, of course, has been appointed to the Pontifical Academy of Science. Uh, he was a key writer of this encyclical. He was also one of the four official presenters. But back in 2009, at that Copenhagen climate conference that we just talked about, the one that failed to get global governance, he said that we had only the capacity to carry a billion people on this planet. So this guy is a radical depopulationist. How are they going to sell a moral agenda? Well, of course, uh, you've got to get rid of these people somehow. I thought it was interesting that just this last week, as China got rid of its one-child policy, we had a Boston professor, I mean, where else would they come from, Sarah Conley, saying that we need a one-world child policy. And of course, that's what's ultimately going to happen if you pursue a policy of depopulation. That is what these people are after. That is what the Pope has embraced, a one-child policy. And listen to the way she puts this. She says, even having two children, the replacement value for the population, as a new Chinese policy allows, is likely to be too many children. By the time the birth rate stabilizes, the global population will be at unsustainable. That's their favorite word, unsustainable, or it is sustainable. Unsustainable level, so we don't have a right to so many children. That's what happens when you say that you embrace this Malthusian view of the world, this view of Gaia theory that looks at humans as a virus that killing the planet. But that's coming from Schellenhuber, the guy who wrote the encyclical for the Pope, the guy who presented the encyclical for the Pope, the guy who is head of his scientific advisory council, the guy who has created all the talking points, the 2% levels, talking about that we are now at the tipping point. But of course, there's another aspect to what Shellen Huber has been pushing, and that is world government. Look at this Catholic uh, publication here, Vox Cantoris. They were concerned about the fact that the Pope was moving towards pushing a world governance. Here's what Shellen Huber talks about, and here's what they had a problem with, because they're Catholics. They want to see the Catholic Church embracing what they believe is the mission of the Catholic Church and not selling a materialistic world government. They say Shellen Huber wishes to influence Canadian Parliament, this guy is in Canada, he says he wants to see a certain percentage of national parliamentary seats earmarked for global ombud, ombuds people. And of course, the term is ombudsman, but that's, uh, I guess, not politically correct enough for Sheldon Huber. And this is what Sheldon Huber said. He said, let me conclude with a daydream about those key institutions that could bring about a sophisticated version of the conventional world government notion. World government notion. Global, and then he inserts the word democracy. There's not going to be any democracy in this. But he says, global, this one world government, might be organized around three core activities. An earth constitution, a global council, a planetary court. I can't discuss these institutions in any detail here. Well, that was six years ago. That was at Copenhagen. Now we can see what they are going to do. We have seen the Vatican now calling for a world government, and it is not an inference. It is not anything that we have to imply from this. This is now being explicitly stated. Listen to what the Vatican said. This pope, these measures ought to be conceived as some of the first steps in view of a public authority with universal jurisdiction. That's world government, folks. As a first stage in a longer effort by the global community to steer its institutions towards achieving the common good. He is selling global governance, global socialism. And he goes on to clarify this. He says, the primacy of politics is over the economy and finance. Understand that what he's talking about here is politics over economy, politics over finance, politics over private property, politics over individual rights. That is essentially what he's talking about when he's pushing global socialist world government. Now, the actual agreement, I give credit to the New American for discovering this. This was on October 31st. Uh, this is something that came out on Saturday. Stealth Agenda, New UN Tribunal to Judge U.S. for Climate Debt. And the only thing I disagree with is that it's a stealth agenda. It's not a stealth agenda except to the people who refuse to listen to what's going on, the people who won't pay attention, who are preoccupied 
with other issues. They point out the official draft text of the climate treaty for the soon to start UN climate summit in Paris, that's the one starting in less than a month, proposes to establish a global Supreme Court. There you go. Now we can see how this is going to break down. That would rule on issues like climate justice, climate finance, technology transfers, climate debt. Let me read to you some of the issues from this. Now, this is the uh, actual draft agreement that I'm looking at here. They say, in terms of setting out their goals for this agreement, they want to recognize the intrinsic relationship between climate change, poverty eradication, and sustainable development. In other words, this is a war on poverty effort, always being used to sell a redistribution of wealth. They say they want to emphasize the need for universal sustained action by all to respond to the urgent threat of climate based on the best available scientific knowledge. And of course, they reference the UN IPCC, which has been putting out a lot of non-scientific conclusions based on this information. But let me read to you the actual article where they talk about establishing a uh, world court. When they talk about facilitating implementation and compliance, in other words, how are they going to enforce these things that they agree to in this upcoming climate change? Well, they say, they have two options. The second option is, and one of them is kind of a little bit voluntary, but the second option is the one that you need to be concerned about. They say an international tribunal of climate justice as a compliance mechanism hereby established to address cases of non-compliance of the commitments of developed countries in terms of finance, technology, development, and transfer, and the development of an indicative, indicative list of consequences taking into account the cause, type, degree, and frequency of non-compliance. In other words, what they're going to do is create a massive bureaucracy, kind of like what we've seen here in the United States with the EPA, with the BLM, with the same kind of abuses, but it will be from a global governance standpoint. Now, listen to what they talk about further on when they talk about how this is going to be enacted. They say the composition of the compliance mechanism will be based on geographical representation. It'll have representation of the least developed countries and small island developing states. It will comprise 12 members. Understand, this is gonna be a board with 12 members that will rule the world. And that's what they will do. And they will enact their decisions based on a two thirds majority. They go on to say an enforcement branch will be, develop will be there for developed countries and a facilitative branch for developing countries. Do you understand the difference? The developed countries are going to get the iron fist. They're going to get enforcement. The developing smaller countries are going to get help. They're going to get facilitation to help them along with this. And that means subsidies. They're going to transfer your wealth. We talked about this as being a redistribution of wealth that's from the richer countries to the poorer countries. That is what this is all about. They say the role of the enforcement branch will be to review compliance and commitments made by the developing countries. The enforcement branch may recommend actions that a developing, developed country party should take. So you're going to get the cops on the developed countries. But the other guys are going to get the soft hand, the subsidy. The role of the facilitative branch will be to assist them in finding ways to incentivize their efforts to meet these commitments. In other words, what we're going to have is an American government that borrows even more money from the banks and then turns it over to these small groups or to the World Bank and then borrows it back again a second time. But we will get the iron fist. And we can see some of these actions coming, and remember there were three different things that were coming this year, and of course the one that was just enacted back in September as the Pope was concluding his visit to the United Nations was the resolution adopted by the General Assembly for Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this has a great deal in it. It has already been enacted. They say this agenda is a plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity. It will eradicate poverty in all of its forms. It is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. And this is for all countries and all stakeholders. And I stop there and I say, wait, wait, wait a minute. All countries, that should be inclusive enough. Why do we have all countries and all stakeholders? Well, folks, because it's the stakeholders, the ones who really own everything, that are going to be making these decisions. It's not going to be global democracy. It is going